Hi. In a fantasy about an imagined world in the distant past, J.R.R. Tolkien penned a striking stanza. This thing all things devours. Birds, beasts, trees, flowers, gnaws iron, bites steel, grinds hard bones to meal, slays king, ruins town, and beats high mountain down. It's shortly revealed that the answer to this riddle is time. It's not too surprising that Gollum, the giver of the riddle, should take such a grim view of time. After all, in the story, he's cursed with extreme longevity in the service of an evil power, forced to endure a continual and everlasting process of decay and corruption. While Middle-earth is an imagined mythology, it has something in common with other classic mythologies popular in Europe. The world is portrayed at its closest to perfection near the beginning of time, and then we observe a long fall from grace as human beings gather more influence. Indeed, many mythologies of time orient themselves around beginning or end points that functionally lay entirely outside of time, giving shape to its trajectory. In one direction, the imagined great past and fall from grace. In the other direction, teleological hypotheticals that orient us toward an imagined future event, the second coming, the revolution, the singularity. Of course, our lived experience of time is rarely at the beginning or the end, and even more rarely lies entirely outside of it. I'd go so far as to say that at any given moment, we are inside time several times over. For example, I'm filming this on a Sunday afternoon. For me, the Sunday afternoon moves at a different pace from other times in the week, conditioned as it is by its place in the market. I typically don't work on Saturdays or Sundays, but I do work on Monday, so the languid and energetic flow of time from Saturday begins to pick up a certain urgency on Sunday as the work week approaches. Also, it's nearly spring right now. That generates an overall feeling of waking up, emerging, etc. that colors all my experiences and their speeds and trajectories. I also have a conscious and subconscious awareness of particular events on the horizon, and their proximity to this moment affects how I experience this moment. I have a doctor's appointment in a couple days. It's been a while, and I hope I'm healthy. I ate a nice full lunch earlier, and that is both energized and satiated me. I have a show coming up. I want to make sure I'm well prepared for it. Some good friends are getting married in a couple months. My family's going with me. I want to rise to the occasion and help make their moment extra special. All these things are happening simultaneously, an overlapping set of events and conditions on various time scales. Together they generate my experience of time in this moment. Here's a question. Is time a substrate that contains and generates all events within it? Or is time continually constructed by the interaction of entities within and through it? In the book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, Karen Barad extrapolates the consequences of quantum mechanics to make the claim that, quote, space, time, and matter are interactively produced in the ongoing differential articulation of the world. Time is not a succession of evenly spaced intervals available as a reference for all bodies, and space is not a collection of pre-existing points set out as a container for matter to inhabit. Iterative interactions are the dynamics through which temporality and spatiality are produced and iteratively reconfigured in the materialization of phenomena. To grossly oversimplify a claim made nearly 300 pages into a dense interdisciplinary text, for Barad, time is indeed continually constructed by the interaction of entities. At the risk of making too broad a leap, I'm gonna go ahead and claim that even if we don't agree with Barad's conclusion with regard to the universe writ gigantic, nonetheless, in the more limited scope of the performing arts, such as music, theater, cinema, even poetry and others, we have the opportunity to utilize time as a medium 
and we have the power to continually construct and refigure time as we see fit via the way we choose to let our chosen instrument interact. As with any repeated gesture over time, it's possible to fall into ruts, patterns, habits, and even to forget that we have this power. We may find ourselves defaulting to particular ways of generating time, acting as if we are constrained by laws that do not actually exist. When I take a step back and think about these patterns, I'm led to questions without definitive answers. Are beat per minute indicators a codified market law made to sort genre and delimit the boundaries of musical expression? Or are they a touchstone for communal creativity, a part of a continually developing cultural language? Perhaps more important than knowing the answer or even there being an answer to questions like this is the opportunity that opens up when we become aware of such questions. Time and causality may ultimately be unknowable, yet in music we can play around with them, entangle them together, generate experiences from them. When you make music, you are on some level aggressively insisting on the existence of time and forcibly wrenching it into existence. So let's make a patch where time and causality are entangled together for expressive use. Essentially, we're going to use maths to measure the passage of time and then the woggle bug to freeze it and send it elsewhere. As you probably know, maths at its core slows things down. It increases the rate of change. When a signal goes up in voltage, maths slows down that change via the rise time. When it goes down, math slows down that change via the fall time. Today, instead of slowing down events, maths is simply going to register the time that passes between them. To do this, we'll patch a touch gate signal to the trigger input. Each time we send a gate, instead of slowing down the rate of change, the maths will generate a function of a length and shape determined by the rise and fall times. Rise, you'll note, is all the way down. The function that comes out the channel output will be at its highest point immediately after the gate comes in and then it will drop continuously. So we can read the value that comes out as essentially a measure of how long it has been since that last gate arrived. Let's listen to it modulating the pitch of the XPO. that when we send the gate, it immediately goes to maximum, then slowly drops. Of course, we can set how slowly using the fall time. Which will thus determine the maximum amount of time passage that it can measure, so to speak. Now let's take the same gate and molt it to the Wogglebug clock input. As you probably know, each gate received at this input generates a new stepped random voltage. However, this time we're not concerned with random values. All we want is to take a measure of how much time has elapsed since the previous gate. So we're going to turn ego id fully counterclockwise so that instead of generating a random value, it samples and holds on the value at the external ego input. And indeed, the signal we're going to patch there is the math's output, which again provides a value proportional to the amount of time that has elapsed since the previous gate. Now let's patch the stepped output of the woggle bug to control the XPO's pitch. When we press a gate, instead of the pitch jumping up and then slowly falling down, it now holds on the value of the math's output just before sending the gate. In other words, the new pitch we send is determined by the amount of time that has passed. A long time between gates results in a lower ride, a, lo in a lower note. A short time between gates results in a higher note.
it may be more obvious to demonstrate by sending a steady clock, such as the clock output of the zero control. As we turn up the clock rate, the resulting pitch gets steadily higher. We can also turn up the time row to add in steps of lower pitch. Of course, with many patches, we have access to the voltage that determines the length of time between events, any automated sequencer patch, for example. In that case, it's easy enough to just use the same source voltage for both the time parameters and whatever else you would want to tie them to. However, when it comes to unpredictable signals, such as playing by hand or processing field recordings or recordings of musicians, etc., or live input from a musician, this is a quick way to generate a voltage that corresponds to the flow of time within those gestures, and then use it to create a causal link between the flow of time and other things that are happening in the patch. Tolkien, Barad, mythologies and cosmologies, the temporal logic of the marketplace, and the constant underpinning knowledge of our own mortality. These are just some of the frames we can utilize to experience that strange, all-encompassing, non-thing we call time. We can find other creative approaches to time organization all over the place. A few favorites of mine would include Curtis Rhodes' Time Scales of Music, the drumming of Tony Williams with the second Miles Davis Quintet in the 60s, or Brian Blade with the Wayne Shorter Footprints Quartet, the iterative time signatures of Second Woman, the writings and art of Black Quantum Futurism. Do you have any favorite non-linear or differently entangled notions of time? Or do you grapple with the shape and flow of time in your own creative practice? This isn't the end, of course, and it's not the beginning. 
I'll leave you with a quote from Ursula Le Guin. In the tale, in the telling, we are all one blood. Take the tail in your teeth then and bite till the blood runs, hoping it's not poison. And we'll all come to the end together and even to the beginning, living as we do in the middle. Thanks for watching and happy patching. Thank you.